Um, well, this isn't very good support for our lady painters, is it? Um, but uh, this evening um, we're going to be talking about Sofonispa Anguissola, which is um, the name of an artist that, that you're probably not hugely uh, familiar with. And I imagine uh, that's why people didn't think it didn't have quite the panache of, of Caravaggio or um, of Van Dyck. Um, but um, you're the lucky ones because uh, Sofonispa is um, a really, really uh, interesting and uh, important figure uh, that sort of, she sort of bridges um, the 16th century and the 17th century. So she has this kind of unique position where um, she, she comes into contact with not only Michelangelo and, and, and Titian, um, but, but also Van Dyck in the following uh, century. So she has this, this sort of bridging, um, uh, bridging position in that she was born in the 1530s and she lives until um, she's well into her 90s, which was really quite extraordinary um, for, for a woman at that time. Um, I must just start the session by uh, letting you all know that I have put my back out today, so I'm in a little bit of discomfort. So we're not gonna have a, a massively long session because I, I think I need to um, keep slightly on the move, um, but I think that that sort of works for, for what I have planned anyway. Um, so I think what we'll start with, I'm gonna show you a couple of images today, um, but as always, I just will start with um, the painting that we're looking at, um, which was painted uh, by Sofonispa um, in around uh, 1559. Um, and we're going to have a, a look at it in, as usual, in its kind of most formal capacity, um, looking literally at, at colours and shapes. Um, and, then, and then I'm going to show you another image which introduces her um, into this series on painting in Sicily, because this painting is currently housed in um, the Nivergard Museum. Uh, don't worry if you haven't heard of it, I hadn't either. It's in, um, in Denmark and uh, just sort of north of Copenhagen. Um, and it was the um, it's the legacy of, of a big private collection um, that had been amassed by a, a merchant and politician, um, I think, in the 19th century. And he purchases this painting from um, uh, an, a Danish artist, actually, who had it in 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 uh, in their collection. So that's why the picture has ended up where it is. Um, and it was painted in Cremona. So it was painted in northern Italy. Um, so, so we have uh, uh, nothing to do with Sicily at this point, but we'll, we'll get there. So we're looking at a painting that's over a metre high, um, so probably just smaller uh, than life size. I have to say, I haven't seen it um, in the flesh. It's oil on canvas, um, and it shows at the centre of the composition, um, rather ironically when we're doing an evening uh, session on a, a female painter, it shows uh, the patriarch of, of her family. Um, it shows um, her father um, and um, a man called Amica Amicale Anguissola, who was a, a nobleman in the, in the community of, of Cremona where, where, um, where Sofonispa grew, grew up. And I think we very much get this sort of presence um, and, and sense of authority from this figure uh, at the center. So um, we can see he's seated, uh, we're looking frontally at his left leg. His right leg is uh, is sort of twisted. Um, so we we kind of see that from from the inside, um, and we can see that he's resting his right hand on his left knee, um, and his left hand is embracing uh, this small child on the right. Um, he's dressed in black. Um, we're going to go a little bit closer because I think this image will. Um, serve as well. Um, he's dressed in black, um, quite a simple uh, outfit, again something that we're going to uh, talk about in a minute, and you can see um, here that the black runs straight onto his feet, so he's almost in a sort of cat suit, um, it appears, um, and he's looking directly out at the viewer with this amazingly penetrating stare, um, a, a stare of, of kind of confidence um, and um, 
quite quite an arresting um, facial expression and and in my view sort of something that perhaps um, expresses uh, pride and um, and as I say confidence um, there's a sort of right a slight smile uh, there um, not no hesitation whatsoever in my view um, and and to his left to our on our right is this gorgeous uh, little boy who is looking up at him admiringly um, and just you know note how the the light uh, catches the the sort of wetness of his eyes um, as he looks up at this uh, figure um, uh, who who stands uh, to, to the side of him and that is um, of course his father so looking up um, a small boy admiring uh, the figure the central quite literally central figure uh, of of his father and this is um, Sofonisba's brother Adruspale so we have um, her little brother here uh, and he's dressed in in red um, we can see these sort of sketchy lines uh, over the the red um, costume that he's wearing now perhaps this is a good moment to talk about why they look like they are dressed in onesies or cat suits um, as we can see here uh, he has uh, these sort of interesting feet uh, or shoes that run into his trousers as well and that is because from here you can probably all see uh, the painting is unfinished which is actually quite surprising I find because it feels at first impression very complete and um, very satisfying to look at. But the closer you get, which is the beauty of um, good images and uh, cult on a Monday night, is that you get to see uh, that the, the painting is, um, is unfinished. And um, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in, in a while, but you can see where uh, the artist is sketched on uh, these, these um, sort of plans, as it were. Um, of course, hoping to embellish uh, what she started. And you can see here, this hand is, um, is, has not been modeled at all, simply sketched in with a kind of light pigment. Um, and, and none of this has been labored in, in any way. Um, and the same goes really for the hand of her, her father. And I think if we really um, look at it and think about it, in my view, the faces actually, looking at it earlier, I thought, that the faces are the only thing really that she's fully finished but it's interesting because that seems to as we've said pull the whole composition together on the other side somewhat uninvolved in um in the in the this sort of um intimate familial embrace between father and son is um one of uh Sophonisba's sisters um her sister called Minerva um, after God, God of, Goddess of Wisdom, um, uh, we can see Minerva sort of looking, certainly in my mind, jealously um, or, or interested perhaps um, at this uh, relationship that is existing between father and, um, and son. Um, I, in my view, she's got nothing to be jealous about because she's dressed fabulously and she's wearing this wonderful, uh, this beautifully embroidered, um, uh, well, uh, sort of, um, there's a sort of skirt here with a bodice over it, and then she has these layers of undergarments. Um, Northern Italy, we don't know when exactly in the year this was painted, I imagine not in the summer months, um, and you can see the, the gilt thread catching the light here, so um, very, very valuable uh, costume, and you can see here these, um, this sort of belt, um, or uh, sort of waist piece, I suppose, um, studded with, with pearls. Um, again, gilt, and you can see the gilt thread in, in the undergarment here. Um, this, this red and gold undergarment that comes through from the sort of blue and silver um, bodice that she's wearing over the top. Um, and then this lovely detail of the shirt that she's wearing tied in a, a little knot at her neck. Um, very delicately and she's clutching um, some flowers to her chest um, and let's just move down we can see again the light catching the embroidery on her skirts um, and we really see that this figure actually is more finished uh, than than the boys um, so a lot more um, work has gone into her um, at least at this point in the process um, the three figures are set against a landscape um, again 
not complete, unfinished. Um, we should also mention, although I mentioned the unfinished part of this of this part of the composition, um, we should mention that he's got this sword uh, coming off the side of his body, this, um, this uh, small boy also showing great promise, um, particularly in the crotch area, um, for, for taking over the, the sort of central uh, patriarchal role in the family. Um, and uh, here we can see um, this lovely little uh, detail of a small, I think, some poodle-like dog um, who's also had some love and attention from Sophonisba before she dashes off um, to Spain, which we'll speak about shortly. And in the background, we can see the um, mountainous landscape, whether this is the um, northern, um, sort of northern Italian mountains, the, uh, the Italian Alps, um, or sort of mountainous regions around uh, the Veneto, uh, Cremona being on the border of Emilia-Romagna and Lombardy. So um, sort of south of Milan, northwest of Parma. Um, I don't think it's particularly mountainous. This seems to me perhaps to be uh, imagine it, um, a, a landscape inspired by her imagination. Um, and we can see almost sort of um, some capricci, some Roman um, inventions of Roman ruins here um, in the distance. But it, it's quite hard to tell because she's sketched in trees and um, it's, certainly not, it's certainly not finished, um, but feels rather fantastical. Uh, and then you have him set against this central pillar or tree trunk, I think it is, um, and um, the, the sort of uh, the bedrock of all this, the, the pillar, the, um, the foundation of the family. Um, and then you have uh, this, this red drapery hanging, um, hanging behind them as well. And if we go into the lower left corner as well, we can see that um, poor Minerva hasn't had her feet sketched in yet. Um, so uh, very much unfinished. And of course, the reason they're wearing these cat suits is because their shoes haven't been finished either. Um, so hopefully that's given us a sort of introduction to the painting. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to share with you um, something very, very different. And this is slightly against my, um, goes slightly against my rules in cult, but I am showing you here um, a portrait of the artist. Now, this is um, uh, particularly um, relevant tonight and important uh, because we are looking at this painting as part of our series on paintings in Sicily. And this is a portrait, a drawn portrait, as you can see, um, by the artist who we got to know a couple of weeks ago, Anthony van Dyck, of Sophonisba Anguissola. So this is quite an extraordinary document. It's in um, Van Dyck's Italian sketchbook, which is in the British Museum, um, bound in one volume and records a number of things that he saw during his seven or so years uh, traveling in Italy in the 1620s. And here we see um, his, the moment, quite literally we see the moment that he encountered the ancient, the old Sofonisba Anguissola in Palermo. Um, so as we've discovered, Sof Sofonisba is from Cremona, that's where she, um, where she was born, but she has two engagements in a sense with Sicily in her life. Uh, one is um, in the middle of her life um, and one is right at the end. And this is where Van Dyck um, finds her. She's living in Palermo with her second husband, um, having spent some number of years in, in Genoa living there with him. And she's moved down to, um, to Palermo um, and she's, she's living in the family palace. He was a, um, a well-connected nobleman. And Van Dyck, who is spending two years in, uh, in Sicily during his travels in Italy, he makes sure that he meets her because she was incredibly famous in her lifetime. Um, so what, what I thought I'd do is, um, introduce uh, the uh, figure of, of Sophonisba just by reading you um, the inscription um, that we can see um, that we can see around the portrait, the written inscription that we can see around the portrait. Um, I'm hoping um, 
can you just give me a thumbs up that you're still looking at the drawing of, great. So you're still looking at the drawing of Sofonisba. So this is what the inscription says in Italian, but I'll read it to you in English. The portrait of the painter Sofonisba Anguissola, painted from life in Palermo on the 12th of July, 1624, her age being 96 years old. She still having a very sharp memory and mind, being most courteous, and although she was lacking in good eyesight because of her old age, she nonetheless found pleasure in placing the paintings in front of her, and with great effort, placing her nose close against the painting, she was able to make out a little of it and took great pleasure that way. In making her portrait, she gave me several pieces of advice, not to raise the light too high so that the shadows and the wrinkles of old age would not grow too large, and many other good suggestions, and moreover, she recounted the part of her life in which she was recognized as a miraculous painter from life. And the greatest torment she had known was not being able to paint anymore because of her failing eyesight. Her hand was still steady without any trembling. So quite a moving um, encounter, a moving inscription um, and uh, incredible record of an interaction between two very, very important um, artists. And this drawn, very quickly sketched portrait um, was a preparatory, as we heard, for a, um, a portrait of Sofonisba. And um, quite recently, uh, a, a small fragment of this portrait, just sort of head and shoulders, was um, located, um, or at least a version of it, but thought to be autographed by Van Dyck, was located um, at um, Knoll in the collection of Lord Sackville. So, um, that that's quite exciting, and it's and it's um, an amazing record. But as we heard by this stage, um, we are in Sicily, but Sofonisba is no longer painting. Um, I think maybe at this point it's um, worth uh, going back to the painting, and I will give you um, a sense of of her life um, and and where Sicily fits in. Otherwise. And perhaps in some of the um, comments that I make, you'll be able to, uh, to see this in the, in the painting that we've just been looking at. But I just wanted to, um, to start uh, with, 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 or at least um, at, at some point, show you that um, quite, quite incredible um, portrait of her in her old age. But let's return to this painting, which was painted, as we can see, when she was uh, fully able to see. Um, and um, I'll give you a, a, a sort of top line uh, biography of, of her. As I said uh, in the introduction, not everyone was here, but um, Sofonisba was this very, very interesting artist in that she bridged these two generations of painters, as we've just seen in the 17th century, um, she met Van Dyck, uh, but she also was interacting um, through letters with Michelangelo. So, she, she lived for a hugely long period of time, but she also lived across uh, these two very important centuries, um, which bred uh, some of our almost uh, celebrated artists. So um, what I think the point I want to make here is that uh, she was born in the 1530s. She paints, we don't know exactly when, probably 1532 to five, um, and she paints this in um, in 1559, so right at the end of her sort of early career, we should say, um, and we'll talk about the second phase shortly. But I think um, it's very visible in this painting to see the kind of monumentality um, of Michelangelo in in these figures, um, and uh, she whether she, she, she probably would have known works by Michelangelo uh, through drawings and engravings, um, and we know that. Michelangelo sends a drawing to her um, as a fledgling um, sort of young painter um, and she copies it and sends it back to him and we know that there's an interaction between them through letters so it's quite um, astonishing that she had this interaction both with Michelangelo um, and then Van Dyck in her latter years um, but here when I say monumentality what I mean is this kind of weight given particularly to the central figure of her father um, often when we look at paintings by Michelangelo and indeed Raphael in the high Renaissance, you see this very, um, this sort of heaviness, um, not only in, in sort of figure um, and build, as we all know from his very muscular figures, but also in drapery and, and, and cloth, you can see there's a, 
um, a kind of the best word really is monumentality to to um, the figures um, that he paints, and we see that here um, uh, very much in in this painting by Sofonisba. But we're also seeing full length portraits, something um, that really were kind of you know coming into um, vogue uh, through through painters like uh, Venetian painters like Titian. Um, so it's a kind of um, a real mix, but as well as having these um, sort of uh, both Venetian and central Italian influences, she's also looking at artists more local to her, um, such as Correggio, who um, comes from nearby Parma. Um, and we see that in the softness of the features of her figures. Um, uh, so she's absorbing everything um, around her. So how did she start painting? Um, Sofonisba was born into a very noble family. Um, her father was, um, uh, he was of minor nobility. Um, her, her mother, Bianca Ponsone, was, um, uh, she was a daughter of a count. So um, they were, I, I suppose they were kind of um, status rich and cash poor. They weren't particularly wealthy, um, but they were, um, but they were sort of, of, um, of good social standing. And, um, I mean, Kale, her father, tries a number of different businesses, including a pharmacy, um, a stationery shop, and um, he, he sort of can't really earn money. So basically, um, his biggest business is his daughter, Sofonisba. He has, he and Bianca have six daughters and one very precious male, which I think we can see um, in this painting. And he comes very much um, sort of towards the end, either I think penultimate or last of the children. Um, so um, what her father does is he effectively sends Sofonisba and her daughter Eleanor to live with a very prestigious um, artist in Cremona called Bernardino Campi. Um, and he, they sort of board with him um, and they learn the art of painting through um, Campi. Um, and it's through him that, that they learn the technique of, of um, painting, sort of um, using the style of Correggio. Um, and, uh, and he hopes very much through these um, kind of, through his network and through these interactions with um, artists, for example, Michelangelo, as we just discussed, that, uh, that Sofonisba is um, particularly is going to uh, develop into um, a great painter and gain um, a brilliant reputation and, um, and uh, pull their family out of financial, the financial crisis that, that they were in. Um, and this very much does happen and very much as a result of her father um, pushing her and, and, and um, sort of capitalizing on this network. And uh, she, she um, although it sort of sounds um, uh, kind of incredibly patriarchal this, it's also, um, hugely, uh, of course, hugely helpful for her and her career. Um, uh, it wasn't, of course, just about funding the family, but also she was gaining her own independent reputation as an artist. And her father wasn't a painter. And that was really unusual because usually um, you, if you were an artist as a woman at this time, your father was a painter. So you were learning from your father. But instead, um, she she was... Um, she was from a noble family and learning the art elsewhere. Um, and she really, her range is quite limited. She, she only really paints portraits. Um, and a lot of her portraits are of herself, self-portraits and of her family, uh, which of course makes sense because female artists didn't have the same kind of formal artistic training um, as male artists. So um, this is what would have been available to her. Um, so through all this networking, she builds a, a very good reputation, painting a um, number of commissions locally in Cremona. And then um, in 1559 to, to early 1560, she is invited to um, the royal court in Spain. She's invited by the King of Spain, Philip II, um, to come to the court to act as lady in waiting to the queen and to teach the art of painting. Um, to the daughters of the King and Queen of Spain. So this is the answer as to why this painting is probably unfinished because she makes a mad dash for Spain around the time um, that it was painted and it was probably left, um, left in Cremona. 
Um, she goes down to Spain and uh, she was sort of the perfect candidate because she was teaching uh, the children um, uh, how to paint, but she was also, um, she was of course of noble descent, so she was um, able to uh, play music and um, uh, of course um, she had humour and she conversed in a, um, in, a, in a sort of courtly manner. Um, so she was a very appropriate candidate um, for that role. And she was also an attendant um, to the Infanta at the time, Isabella Clara Eugenia, who then becomes um, the Archduchess Isabella, who is one of Rubens' greatest paintings. So um, there are all these, all these connections. Um, anyway, she stays in Madrid, or she's, at least she's employed or paid by the Spanish royal court for about 20 years. Um, so it really is, um, it is the making of her. Sadly, most of the paintings we have by her come from this early period. Um, there was a, a fire in 17th century, which destroyed, I think, all but five of, of the paintings that we think um, are from her Spanish period. Um, but there are a couple of the royal family in the Prado, and you can see those online. Um, but um, it was here in, in Spain that she um, was married by proxy to um, a Sicilian nobleman. Now I've confused you by talking about another Sicilian no nobleman. This was the first Sicilian nobleman. So she married um, a man called Fabrizio de Moncada and he, she married him by proxy um, from Spain. Um, and then she travels to, uh, in I think November or October of uh, 1573, she travels to Sicily, um, where I think they live in Catania um, and or Messina, uh, and she stays there with him. In 1578, sadly, he is killed rather dramatically by pirates off the coast of Capri. Um, and so she travels with her brother. She calls upon her brother, who we see in this painting, um, and she travels uh, north to um, I think she's going up to Genoa, um, and on this journey she meets um, the, the well, captain of the ship, a man called Horatio Lomellino. She um, starts a liaison with him and he becomes her second husband and they live in Genoa for nine or so years, I think. And then in around 1616, um, they move down to Sicily and they live in, uh, in Palermo together. Um, and you can still visit the square, uh, in which in which she um, she lived, obviously now it's it's modern modern buildings. Um, but they built a life together um, there, um, and he was um, well. Fabrizio, her first Sicilian husband, her, his brother had been the viceroy of Sicily, um, and Orazio Lomellino was sort of um, also um, a kind of consul, um, I think, in Genoa. So um, they and he had his family palace in Palermo as well. So. Um, she was very much married into society um, and her dowry was paid certainly for her first marriage by the king of Spain or king and queen of Spain. Um, I think it was actually paid by the queen. Um, and she, so she doesn't really need to carry on painting. Um, so most of the work that, um, that, that, that we have, as I say, comes from this, comes from this early period. And, um, it includes a number of very touching portraits um, of, of her siblings. There's a, another very famous painting in Poland, actually, of um, Minerva, this sister, and two other sisters um, and a maidservant pay, playing chess. Um, and uh, and she, she paints also a number of, of self-portraits as well, um, as, as we've talked about. This is a, a way, obviously, of her, her uh, practicing her art um, by simply looking, looking in the mirror. Um, she was buried in um, a church in Palermo, and another um, short reading I want to do is the uh, epitaph, which was placed um, on her tomb, I think, on the anniversary, the 100th anniversary, on her 100th birthday, effectively. Um, and uh, and the, the, the um, inscription um, says, to Sophonisba, my wife, uh, whose parents are the noble Anguissola, who is recorded among the illustrious women of the world for her beauty and her extraordinary gifts. She was outstanding in portraying images of men, so excellent that there was no equal in her time, 
Orazio Lomellino, in Sorry for the Loss of His Great Love in 1632, dedicated this small tribute to such a great woman. So again, very um, touching and um, sort of moving inscription on the epitaph, which, which you can um, still, still visit in, in the church in which she's buried. Um, so I suppose another thing I wanted to mention about, not necessarily here, because at this point she's not been to Spain, um, but the impact also of um, artists that had been working at the Spanish court and that Im the impact that they would have had on her. And one of these um, who I don't think she would have met, um, but was very much active in, uh, in, at the Spanish court and certainly in relation with Philip II um, was Titian. Um, and so she would have been privy to the huge number of paintings, effectively all the Titians that you can see in the Prado, pretty much, um, all, all the paintings sort of pre, you know, that, that predate her death. Um, um, uh, sort of all the, all, all the paintings that you can see in the Prado by Titian, you know, she would have had, um, had access to, to, to these pictures um, and they would very much have inspired her work. So, um, so as I say, stylistically influenced by these 16th century artists, giving advice to Van Dyck um, in the 17th century, um, and, um, and then um, in, in sort of future years, um, having, having huge uh, influence also on, on other artists, notably on other female painters. And I think that's, that's something that's uh, important probably to, to make a, a note of is that um, Sophonisba was, she was regarded as probably the most successful female Renaissance painter, at least in the 16th century. Um, but she inspired the next generation. So an Italian painter, Lavinia Fontana, who comes after her, um, was said to have seen a painting by Sofonisba and be inspired to sort of um, to, to make a success of painting. Um, so she inspired other women uh, to, to practice uh, the art of painting. Um, and of course, we know uh, so much about Artemisia Gentileschi, particularly in recent years, um, but only now really slowly are these artists, these female artists coming out of the shadows. Um, and I think, I think that's for a number of reasons, to be honest. I think, um, I think of course, um, the, uh, the, the sort of historiography has meant that men and male painters have been pushed to the fore um, and that, that women painters weren't, weren't perhaps so much um, studied and written about in, um, in, in sort of ac academia um, in the history of art. But, at the same time, I also think that women weren't afforded the opportunities that men were afforded in order to train. So there were certainly less of them. And when you have female painters, notably they are painting still life, um, flowers, as we see with some of the 17th century Dutch painters, flower still lifes, um, and, and portraits or self-portraits. And I think um, that's why artists like Artemisia for example, are so unusual because she was painting uh, sort of wild um, Old Testament, big Baroque subjects, you know, big stories, lots of blood, lots of nudity, uh, lots of drama. Um, her, her compositions were hugely theatrical. And of course she learned with her father, Arezzo Gentileschi, um, that's where she learned, learned the art of painting um, uh, compositions such as these. Um, and I think Sofonisba is an example of, of the, the former. I think Sofonisba, while she's clearly incredibly skilled um, and uh, you know, she, she enjoyed a very successful career, um, she has a limited range, uh, as, we, as we said, um, and that she was really employed at the court to, to teach uh, painting um, rather than necessarily to kind of make a career as a court painter. Um, and so while she was incredibly successful as a female painter in the 16th century, and you're probably all thinking, why don't we know much about her? I think um, there's sort of good reason for that. I think, I mean, not necessarily justified, but I think uh, the fact that she, she was not working at these courts um, in a kind of court painter, painter capacity uh, means that she had a very different role to someone like Van Dyck, for example. 
um, and that she was very much there as a kind of courtier, a courtier as well uh, as a painter, um, and also that her that her paintings um, are limited and a huge and a, a huge obviously a huge issue with um, with Sophonisba's earth is of course that um, so many of her works at in, that she painted in Spain um, were were in fact um, uh, destroyed in this fire. Um, I mean, we haven't talked, we talked a bit about the painting to, uh, to begin with. Um, I sort of feel like I kind of covered everything I wanted to say. Um, this, this sort of sense in the picture of um, jealous daughter, uh, we can't know, but is this um, Sophonisba narrating the story of her role as, um, as a daughter, the eldest daughter, we should say as well. Um, she was the first born. So is this the story of her, um, uh, so is, is she narrating the story of her role as eldest, ultimately the heir um, of, of, of her family, um, but because she's a woman um, being put behind her tiniest um, sibling, um, or at least second tiniest sibling, her brother. Um, and is this a way of kind of expressing it through the sort of face of Minerva and um, seeing her, uh, her holding this sort of um, very domestic, pious uh, corsage of flowers to her chest um, and, and looking almost sort of enviously over at her brother, who has this very touching engagement with his father um, at the centre um, the focus literally right in the middle of the painting. Um, and you can see how he's sort of eschewing her by putting his knee right out in front of her um, and really paying her no attention at all. Um, and, and sort of all of the focus is, is on this, the, the kind of li literal um, sort of, uh, jump between father and son and, and this kind of the composition, the connection uh, the linkage of the hands onto the body and, and the hands together, literally forming this um, this sort of visual link between the two of them. Um, while, and I don't think being unfinished on the bottom part helps, but while Minerva is um, is sort of very much um, feels sort of almost ghostly and uninvolved in this um, in this composition, and that may be um, may be softening for making that uh, making that point. Um, but certainly figures like this, I mean, when I look at a figure like that, I just think immediately of Titian. So um, I, she wasn't far from Venice, um, and I don't know what her engagement with Titian might have been, um, but certainly there would have been engravings circulating at this time. And I, I really feel um, both Titian and Michelangelo, this seated figure um, here is very Michelangelo-esque. Um, and, and this figure here is very, uh, um, very Titian-esque, and in fact, she feels like very like Veronese's women, very highly decorated and embellished, um, and they have the softness of Correggio. So um, certainly at this geographical point, this central geographical point in Cremona, um, you can see that she's sort of um, fusing a number of styles that she might have seen or come into contact with um, into, into her own unique, um, her own unique style. Um, but certainly incredibly, incredibly talented and it was for this reason um, that, that of course um, the whole package that she was invited to Spain. Um, so the Sicilian link is there. Um, as far as I know we don't have any paintings by her um, that she painted in Sicily, that might be incorrect, but um, none that are, uh, I mean this painting is one of her best known, um, so I thought would be representative. Um, of the artist, um, but mainly her kind of physical presence in, in Sicily, uh, which of course had links with Spain or with Naples, which in turn had links with Spain. Um, and I think Milan at the time was also under um, Spanish rule as well. So um, that there, were, there were a number of reasons for her to, to venture to, down to Sicily um, and then to be there. Uh, at the end of her at the end of her life as well and and be buried there 